is coiled up. And it, if you look at it under a magnifying glass, the coil is made up of another, even finer, tiny coil. It's called a coiled coil. The more compactly a filament can be wound, the less heat it loses to the surroundings and the brighter it glows. Oh no, the bulb's gone again. <laughs> You wouldn't have to go through this performance. Light bulbs never last forever because at their working temperature, two and a half thousand degrees centigrade, the filament gradually evaporates. Boy, where's the bulb? I'll get one of the new ones. Thorn EMI double life light bulbs. Double the life, but not double the cost. In the late 50s, a dramatically improved sort of filament bulb was invented, tungsten halogen. These are used for outside lights, for um, car headlights and for tiny little shop spotlights. They give off twice as much light as ordinary bulbs running at a higher temperature. And even so, they last twice as long. This is because they have minute traces of gases inside called halogens, which repel the evaporating tungsten from the surface of the bulb, making it redeposit itself back on the filament, a sort of cycle. This only works if the glass is kept very hot, 250 degrees centigrade. That's uh, easily enough to boil water. The problem with any sort of filament light, though, is that it's actually extremely wasteful of energy. An ordinary bulb only gives out 10% of its electricity as light. All the rest is wasted as heat. And even the most efficient tungsten halogen bulb only gives out 25% as light. There's more to lighting, though, than simple efficiency. It's also extremely decorative. And there's an astonishing range of decorative bulbs available. I incorporate lights in all sorts of things that I make. This ring was inspired by these little bright red lights. They look to me like sort of modern jewels. This is a bedside light I made, like a sort of office block with its window cleaners. This is a nuclear mint in here. It's a packet of mints I bought at the shop of our local nuclear reactors visitor centre. I lit it to make it look suitably dangerous. Lights aren't only decorative. Films in particular have always used them for their dramatic effect. No, you're wrong. That's how you always intended to spend the evening, not with George at all. Don't say that. And for a very good reason. Now you keep quiet. Don't say that. Now keep quiet. Molly, now listen to me. Listen to me, Molly. I'm not going to listen to you. I think I know the truth, Molly. No, you don't. You don't know anything at all. I think I know the truth about George. You can't, you know. You couldn't have met George tonight. No, no, no. Because there isn't any George. No, no, no. <laughs> Well, how's this, Nancy? Better, huh? Oh, this is wonderful. I wished I had one of those magic wands so I could fly around whenever I wanted to. Nothing simpler, Nancy. Here. <coughs> However, that wand is good for much more important things than flying around through the air. It's a fluorescent light tube. Today's efficient fluorescent lights develop from the original arc lights. This tiny high voltage arc doesn't reach far or give off much light. But um, if I connect the wires to the ends of this glass tube, switch it on again, switch off the lights and start pumping the air out of the tube. Instead of forming an arc, the electricity fills the entire tube with a glowing discharge. This is the basis of fluorescent and many other types of electric light. Although in its basic form, it's not really bright enough to be useful. When it was first discovered, these tubes were bent into funny shapes and demonstrated as wonders of science. If I apply a voltage to this one, 
because you can see it closed. And over here, we have the selection that we borrowed from the Royal Institution, called Geisler tubes, and they were made in the 1860s. In 1905, a French inventor called Georges Claude found that a newly discovered gas, neon, made the tube glow bright red. He immediately realised its potential for illuminated signs, and by the 1920s had managed to sell a large number of franchises, particularly in America. The first fluorescent light was introduced in 1939. This is the same idea as our vacuum tube, except there's a little tungsten filament at each end. The idea is that uh, heating these up for a moment encourages the electricity to start flowing. In the tube, there's a starter to do this switching and a ballast to limit the amount of current that can pass through it. The inside of the tube is filled with a mixture of argon and mercury vapour. This is giving out mostly ultraviolet light. That's why I'm wearing these protective goggles. But fortunately, there are chemicals that can convert the ultraviolet to visible light, a property called fluorescence. If I switch the light off for a minute, you can see they're actually just white powders. Tube manufacturers mix these fluorescent materials, creating any colour, combination of colours, they want. See if I can get some to... These are coated onto the inside of the tube. Neon tubes can also be coated in phosphors, creating almost a complete spectrum of colours. The odd thing about fluorescent tubes is you don't even have to connect them to electricity to make them work. If I put this one in a microwave oven... Switch on. It will work. And if you excite it by a radio frequency or a very high frequency, um, it will also work without being connected. Like I've got a, another milk bottle here and we've put fluorescent materials inside this, stuck it on the inside. I've evacuated this one that's connected up to my vacuum pump and uh, if I connect this up to our high frequency again, we'll have a fluorescent milk bottle. I've made ordinary filament light bulbs which appear to be uh, uh, normal, but if you look at this one, it's a big trick. And it's actually wires run up the back of my hand to a battery. And this was made for a magician. Fluorescent tubes are highly efficient, giving out four times as much light for the same amount of electricity as an ordinary light bulb. They've become the standard lighting for factories, shops and offices, providing uniform brightness over vast areas. However, architects and designers now often deliberately use lighting to create different moods. Lighting is not only bulbs, no. It's an environment-enhancing, ambience-arousing concept. Uh, look, please, uh, at this stylish desk light, which offers superb visual clarity for workstations. Oh, perfect. Beige is such a tricky colour to work with. And this versatile grid makes imaginative and creative focus for reception areas. Why, I? Disco lights. Slashing. Now a soft, diffuse light 